story of the Dambusters raid begins not during the Second World War, but much earlier in the early 1930s, when the National Socialist Government of Germany rose to power. Almost immediately, they began to rearm the country, much to the alarm of its European neighbors. By 1937, Germany had a formidable war machine at its disposal, and a leader determined to utilize it for his own ambitions. In Britain, a committee was set up to evaluate how Germany could be attacked in the event of hostilities. After all, it was only some 20 years since Germany had thrown the world into the Great War. Central to this plan was the bomber. In the 1930s, proponents of strategic bombing considered that a force of armed aircraft could fight their way across an enemy's frontiers and bomb its industry, thus rendering him unable to prosecute a war. The Air Target Subcommittee identified 45 industrial targets and earmarked them for destruction. The Ruhr Valley was at the heart of Germany's industrial war machine. It was here that hundreds of factories were producing steel for the guns, tanks, ships and munitions that would eventually feed Hitler's Third Reich. Water was an essential element for the production of steel. It took on average 100 tons of water to produce one ton of steel. The water was supplied to the Ruhr Valley by means of enormous dams located to the east of the industrial area. Of the many dams in Germany, air staff singled out six for possible attack. The three largest were chosen as main targets. The Myrna, Ada, and Zarpe. In total, they contain three quarters of the water on which the Ruhr relied for its steel production. If somehow these dams could be destroyed, then it was reasoned that the production of the Third Reich would suffer a severe blow and reduce their capacity to wage war effectively. Extensive flooding would create widespread damage, as well as depriving hydroelectric plants and local communities of their water supplies. However, there was one serious difficulty to overcome. Dams are very formidable structures, solid, strong and very large. The planners paused. Could they be destroyed? A major problem for RAF Bomber Command in attacking such targets was bomb size. At the outbreak of war in September 1939, the standard weapon carried by bombers, such as the Wellington, was the 500-pound general purpose bomb. All agreed that even if hundreds of these were dropped on a target as huge as a dam, it would barely damage it. It seemed an insurmountable problem. But by the spring of 1940, one man thought he might have an answer. A brilliant aeronautical designer named Barnes Wallace had been working on his own ways of shortening the war. Wallace worked for the Vickers Armstrong Aircraft Company and was already well established as one of Britain's chief aircraft engineers. He had a string of successful designs to his credit, including the Wellington Bomber, which had been in RAF frontline service since 1938. This outstanding aircraft utilized a unique structure known as geodetics. Basically, comprising an interlacing latticework of aluminium, it was both light and strong. It was an aircraft able to absorb amazing amounts of damage and still get its crews safely home. In private, Wallace had been studying ways to deprive Germany of its sources of natural power, so vital to modern industrial production. Through his exhaustive research, he had also identified the dams as important targets. From late 1939, he set himself the personal task of finding out whether these structures could be destroyed. His studies unearthed much about Germany's water usage. The Ruhr Valley dams owed their existence to the region's susceptibility to flooding from heavy spring and autumn rainfall. Dams are usually constructed across a flood valley. Over time, rainfall fills the valley to form a reservoir. The water can then be drawn off to supply hydroelectric plants and local towns, whilst controlling the unexpected flooding problem and ensuring vast amounts of water are available to heavy industries and domestic properties during dry periods. The Ruhr Valley dams consisted of two main types. Firstly, a gravity dam a design that is effectively a tapering stone wall, triangular in section, with the widest points being at the base, to withstand the immense water pressure which acts against it. 
Some gravity dams are also curved to resist the tendency for water to try and push the structure downstream. They are anchored to the valley at each end and are held in place by their sheer weight. The Myrna and Ada dams are fine examples of this particular design. To illustrate the size, this scale computer model shows a person standing on the crest of the Myrna Dam, which itself is over a quarter of a mile wide. Secondly is the shallower earth type, which is a totally different design to the gravity dam. It comprises a central concrete core, with each side being built up of sloping banks of earth and rubble. These pose different problems for a potential attacker, since the earth banks effectively shield the watertight core from a bomb. The only earth dam chosen by the air staff was the Zorpe, shown here, an immense structure over six times thicker at its base than the Myrna. These three dams would form the heart of any proposed attack. Up to this point, several ideas have been put forward to destroy the dams. One of the first considered was to airdrop a self-powered skimmer containing explosives, which would propel itself to the dam wall, sinking upon contact. A fuse would detonate the explosives at a set depth. This was rejected because the Germans had installed floating defensive booms across the reservoir in anticipation of such an attack. Another proposal was to drop special torpedoes, which was also rejected because the booms supported thick steel nets, which would block their passage. Even a commander raid by parachute to apply demolition charges to vital parts of the structure was considered. However, due to the potential high casualty rate to the attacking force, this plan was shelved. Wallace, however, had a more viable proposition for the air planners. Wallace's idea was more conventional, if less heroic. He proposed dropping a 10-ton bomb from 40,000 feet. On descent, the angled tail fins would start it rotating, and as it entered the earth at the speed of sound, the spin would help the bomb to penetrate the earth in a corkscrew motion. The Air Ministry greeted the idea with skepticism. They argued that to develop a bomber through its design, testing and introduction to service phases had taken an average of six years. Furthermore, Britain, it was claimed, did not have the capacity or the space in existing aircraft production to build it. After a year, Wallace's big bomb concept and its parent aircraft were cancelled. Wallace returned to the drawing board, still considering his ideas to be sound. He abandoned large bomb development for the moment, deciding to concentrate on accuracy issues rather than size. This, he hoped, would open up new avenues of possibility. Wallace's work had, however, aroused interest in other circles. His persistence that German dams were worth investigating led Wallace to seek the assistance of the Road Research Laboratory at Harmonsworth. Since 1940, engineers, under the direction of Dr. William Glanville, had been conducting tests upon scale models. They had been trying to discover how much charge would be necessary to breach the Myrna Dam. After early disappointments, they made a breakthrough. It was discovered that if a charge was detonated in water instead of air, the shock waves from the explosion would be applied against the dam wall for longer than the explosion itself due simply to water being much denser than air. It was simple physics. With this in mind, Wallace wondered whether a form of depth charge could be used. Although a submerged detonation was more efficient than air, another problem presented itself. The water between the dam and the explosion was absorbing much of the generated pressure. To destroy a dam with this method, still required a weight of explosive far in excess of the carrying capacity of any available aircraft. In early 1942, the desperately needed breakthrough was made. If the charge was placed hard against the dam wall, the shock waves would be focused and amplified instead of absorbed, thus cracking the masonry. The enormous weight of water, which had been blasted away from the dam face in the initial explosion, would then return once the initial shock waves had dissipated and breach it. In 
His next experiment would be on a much grander scale. The Birmingham City Corporation allowed the test team to conduct experiments at the disused Nantigro Dam in Wales. This structure was one-fifth the size of the Myrna. From Dr. Glanville's tests on scale models, Wallace knew that 279 pounds of explosive would be required to make a breach. This first test, carried out in early 1942, shows the result of a non-contact explosion. The water between the explosion and the dam wall absorbs the pressure shock waves, cancelling out the pressure. For the next test, the team planned to carry out a contact detonation. Glanville was able to acquire a 500-pound anti-submarine mine. It was lowered into position against the face of the dam, while observers, including Barnes-Wallace, retired to a safe distance. At 5 o'clock on July the 24th, the mine was detonated. The result was conclusive. Wallace was elated. Wallace realized that a contact detonation was the key to destroying the dams. They calculated that the weight of explosive needed to breach the Myrna was 6,500 pounds, well within the carrying capacity of Bomber Command's new aircraft, the Avro Lancaster, now coming into service. But could the RAF deliver a weapon to within a few feet of the target? A report published in 1941 did not make encouraging reading. It estimated that only one in ten bombers were getting within five miles of their target. In regions close to the German frontier, aircraft were even bombing the wrong country as a result of poor navigation and bomb aiming equipment. Clearly, high-level bombing had not yet come of age. Wallace would have to find a new method of delivering his weapon, one which had to be dropped with uncompromising accuracy. The question was how. Nelson uh, used the one bounce which you will get up from a spherical cannonball to increase the range of his cannon because he was far down at the water and the bomb, the cannonball would bounce and hit a ship further away. But I discovered that if you rotate it, so that the underside of the rotation is going in the same direction as the bomb, you can get a long run. I've actually run a ball two and a quarter miles in the open sea off the coast of Norfolk. During April 1942, he tested this idea in the privacy of his Surrey garden. He had built a homemade catapult and spent hours firing his daughter's marbles off the family washtub in an attempt to calculate the feasibility of using such a principle. Later at the National Physical Laboratory at Teddington, he conducted further tests. Here he was able to refine his work by firing balls of different weights, sizes and materials until he could calculate the bounce ratios necessary to reach a damn wall. A breakthrough was made when he applied backspin to the projectiles, which had the effect of increasing their range. It would travel to the target in a series of tremendous leaps across the surface of the water. The added backspin would also help by drawing the projectile back against the wall, hugging it as it sank to the required depth, now calculated at 30 feet. Three hydrostatic pistols would then detonate the charge. Interest was such that Wallace was able to obtain a Wellington bomber and specially convert it for testing the principles from the air. The bomb bay doors were removed and gearing installed to impart backspin to the spherical bombs. On December the 4th, 1942, a group of observers assembled on the shore of Chesil Beach near Weymouth. As the Wellington approached with Wallace as bomb aimer, a team on shore began to operate a slow motion camera, patiently waiting for the flash that would signal the moment of release. Wallace held his breath.
To everyone's dismay, it burst. Undeterred, Wallace had the remaining casings strengthened. These early drops experimented with different release heights, airspeed, and varying backspin revolution ratios. Over successive weeks, the trials became more and more successful. One story at the time of the trial suggests that the Wellington was engaged by a flak battery on its flight to the test range. Gunners below, seemingly confused by the unusual shape of its cargo, failed to recognize it as friendly and open fire. Veteran Vickers test pilot Mud Summers, often at the flight controls and who six years earlier had test flown the prototype Spitfire, denied the incident ever took place. After the success of these trials, Wallace was ready to explain the science behind his idea, confident that he could win over his critics. He wrote all of his data into a paper simply entitled, Air Attack on Dams. In February 1943, a copy reached the Commander-in-Chief of Bomber Command, Arthur Harris. He was not impressed. He wrote of his strong disapproval in a letter to Air Vice Marshal Sornby. This is tripe of the wildest description. There are so many ifs and ands that there is not the smallest chance of it working. Harris was notorious for having a mistrust of inventors. The idea of bouncing a five-ton ball of steel across a lake was to him worthy of nothing but contempt. Wallace later visited him with his test films and after viewing them, Harris did admit that the weapon had potential. One man who also saw the film was the first Sea Lord, Sir Dudley Pound, and he was not so skeptical. Indeed, he was very keen to try the weapon against capital ships. The Navy sponsored a version to be developed, which would be used by the smaller, faster mosquitoes. As it would transpire, this naval version would evolve parallel to Wallace's dam-busting designs. On his return to Vickers at Weybridge, Wallace was summoned to the office of the managing director of Vickers Armstrong, Sir Charles Craven. He informed Wallace that all work was to cease on the dam's project as it had been cancelled. A shocked Wallace offered his resignation. An angry Craven slammed his fist into the desk and cried mutiny. The dams had to be attacked during the spring, when rains would have filled the reservoirs to their highest level. It would also have to coincide with the short full moon period, so the crews could locate the target. The last possible date for an attack would be May the 26th. This decision to go ahead left Wallace barely eight weeks to perfect his bomb. As Wallace went to work on his bomb, Harris assigned Air Vice Marshal Cochrane the task of forming a squadron capable of carrying out the attack. Initially known only as Squadron X, it would become 617 Squadron and be formed by air crews, most of whom had or were about to complete their current tours of 30 operations. RAF Scampton was chosen as its base and Harris recommended that it be led by Wing Commander Guy Gibson. Gibson was a seasoned veteran who had completed over 160 missions, earning him the Distinguished Flying Cross and Distinguished Service Order by the age of 24. By March 27th, most of the 133 crewmen Gibson had chosen, along with the ground staff, had arrived. These were some of the most experienced men in Bomber Command. Ages ranged from 20 to 32 with some from the UK, America and Canada, others from Australia and New Zealand. Initially, Gibson and the men were told that they would make just one trip and attack a lightly defended target over water, at low level and at night. They would have to fly to Germany at less than 200 feet to have any chance of evading the defences and reaching their targets. As a result, 617 Squadron practiced flying low over the large lakes and reservoirs in England and Wales to a degree well beyond any other aircraft or crew. Meanwhile, the Navy were making advances with its smaller spherical weapon, now codenamed Highball. Design changes were made throughout its development. 
in this film, a mosquito drops two highballs. The first one's outer casing shatters due to the violent battering it receives on impact with the sea. This tendency to burst required the strengthening of the whole weapon. Experimental casings were dropped from various heights at Porton Down on Salisbury Plain. These tests were carried out to determine the strength required to survive high-speed impacts with the water and ultimately the formidable side armor of battleships. Spinning trials were also carried out at Horton Down on a grounded mosquito. This aircraft acted as a balancing test bed to check the weight distribution. An unevenly filled weapon rotating at high speed could easily tear itself from the parent aircraft and result in serious damage. Development then moved to a more realistic target. An old battleship named HMS Malaya was anchored in the West Coast Valley of Loch Striven. De Havilland mosquitoes use this vulnerable ship as a guinea pig for most of their dummy runs. The advantage Highball had over other forms of attack was that it could reach more sensitive parts of the ship. Most battleships have reinforced decks and protection added to the side of the hull known as the belt. If Highball hit the belt, it would sink below the surface and via backspin crawl under the vulnerable keel before exploding. Highball weighed around 1,000 pounds, enough to create significant damage to the submerged overlapping hull plating and cause severe flooding within the interior of the vessel. A special squadron, 618, was formed shortly after. It was eventually deployed to the Pacific to engage the Japanese battle fleet, but the war ended before they could be used in action. By this time, Wallace had designed the full-size dam-busting bomb, codenamed Upkeep. The term bouncing bomb is somewhat of a misnomer, as the weapon is more accurately described as a revolving depth charge. It consisted of a metal cylinder, 50 inches by 60. Inside, three hydrostatic pistols would detonate the 6,500 pounds of Torpex explosive. With a fourth central fuse, time to explode 90 seconds after the bomb was dropped in case the pistols failed. With the outer casing, the weapon weighed a total of 9,250 pounds. The original intention was for the bomb to be spherical, similar to earlier versions. But due to the pressures of war, it was found easier to manufacture steel cylinders. So Vickers engineers sphericalized the drum with wooden staves, which were held in place by metal bands. The first aircraft, flown by Sam Brown, dropped its weapon from 120 feet but due to the excessive height, it sank almost immediately. The second aircraft, piloted by Mutt Summers, released at 60 feet. The outer casing burst upon impact, sending splintered staves and steel bands flying in all directions. One wooden stave smashed into the Lancaster's elevator, jamming it, causing Summers to have serious problems upon landing. Watching this film, Wallace noticed how the bare cylinder kept bouncing even after the casing had departed. This led him to dispense with the outer casing altogether. The weapon to be used against the dams had now been agreed, and the development process was underway. Firstly, alterations had to be made to the standard factory Lancasters. This involved a number of modifications, including the removal of the bomb doors. This would enable two external V-shaped caliper arms to be fitted. These would grasp the bomb while a hydraulic motor within the fuselage provided its rotation via a belt. The motor would be started 10 minutes before the bombing run. When the aircraft, flying at a speed of 232 miles per hour, reached the dropping point, the bomb aimer pressed the release button. Tension springs would force the arms outward and the upkeep mine now spinning at 500 revolutions per minute, would fall clear of the aircraft. Wallace knew from the trials that the height was causing the cylinders to sink, due mainly to the acute drop angle. Upon asking Gibson if they could lessen the angle by reducing the drop height from 150 feet to 60, Gibson was perturbed. Flying an aircraft as large as a Lancaster was hazardous enough at 150 feet. 
At 60, a pilot only had to drop a wing and it would be on the ground. It also raised another problem. The low level rendered their altimeters useless. With Wallace insisting on a drop height of 60 feet, how to maintain it over water at night was now the problem. It was solved not in a London theatre, as the feature film suggests, but by Ben Lockspeiter at the Ministry of Aircraft Production. He remembered how trials had been conducted by Coastal Command in 1942 using spotlights. The idea had been abandoned due to its ineffectiveness in choppy seas. The dam attack, however, would be made across relatively still lakes. Engineers at Farnborough fitted the Lancaster with two spot lamps, one in the front camera aperture and the second in the rear of the bomb bay. Both were angled to shine down and to starboard, enabling the navigator to watch the light's positions through a perspex blister on the side of the canopy. From here, he could advise the pilot if he was too high or too low. The correct height would be achieved when both beams crossed, forming a figure of eight. 617 Squadron practice over Scampton Airfield before practicing over water. During the next few days, Vickers test pilots continued to perfect the weapon. 617 Squadron air crews flew to Reculver to practice with inert upkeep bombs. Instead of flying parallel to the shore, they approached from head on to deliver the dummy weapons against the inclined beach. Pilots David Shannon, Les Munro, and Les Knight arrived on the 12th of May. Attending witnesses watched as Shannon's bomb bounced a good distance, rolling up the beach. Les Munro was not so lucky. When he released under the stipulated 60 feet and the resulting water spray damaged his tailplane. Fortunately, it was repairable. Not so the following day, when Henry Maudsley suffered a similar fate to Munro. His aircraft was badly damaged and could not be repaired in time for the operation. The squadron was now down to 19 aircraft. With the upkeep mine being carried externally, Roy Chadwick from Avros, makers of the Lancasters, recommended that the aircraft should have their top turret removed to help cancel out the added drag and to save weight. This meant that the top turret gunner would not have a position within the aircraft. He was relocated permanently into the front turret, which was frequented on normal occasions by the bomb aimer. This allowed him to assist with navigation, lying in the front blister, communicating visual information to the navigator, as well as keeping watch for high-tension pylons and other obstacles. To prevent the gunner's legs from dangling in his face, stirrups were installed in all aircraft to keep them out of the way. The attack procedure would require a high degree of teamwork. The pilot would be responsible for direction, the flight engineer for speed, the navigator for height, the bomb aimer for range, and the front and rear gunners would fire at the defenses. It was decided to load the guns with 100% tracer ammunition in order to provide the greatest scare effect. The bomb aimer had to release the bomb at a specific point. Too early and it would not reach the wall. Too late and it would bounce over with the risk of it exploding underneath the aircraft and killing the crew. From aerial photographs of the Myrna and Ada, the engineers came up with a simple solution. The distance between the two sluice towers on the Myrna Dam, for example, was calculated at 700 feet. The drop point for the bomb was 476 yards from the wall. These three points formed a triangle whose information was transferred into a rudimentary bomb site. On the attack run, the bomb aimer would need to look through a peephole and wait until the two nails lined up with the damn tires. Only then would the bomb be released. 
However, once the principle had been established, many bomb aimers devised their own variations, which were easier to use. On May the 13th, 1943, the only test of a live upkeep took place. Two Lancasters had flown to RAF Manston in Kent to be readied. One would carry the weapon and the second would film the result. Squadron leader Longbottom would pilot the releasing aircraft, which would fly at 75 feet. And the second, flown by Bob Handersade, would follow behind at 1,000 feet to record the results. The explosion created a water spout of over 1,500 feet. Only 72 hours remained until upkeep would be dropped in anger. On Sunday, May the 16th, all 133 crew learnt what their targets were to be. Many were relieved. They thought it might be the fearsome German battleship, the Tirpitz. For many, it was the longest briefing they had ever attended. Throughout the day, bomb aimers, navigators, pilots and wireless operators were briefed on their specific roles. Barnes Wallace explained the science behind the weapon they were soon to deliver and the crucial code words were finalized. Goner would signal a successful drop but no breach. Nigger, a breach in the Myrna. And Dinghy, a breach in the Ada. The aircraft would take off in three waves. Wave one would consist of nine Lancasters, taking off in sections of three, ten minutes apart. They would proceed directly to the Myrna, using VHF radio to coordinate the attack, moving on to the Ada only when a breach in the Myrna had been achieved. Wave two, consisting of five Lancasters, would head straight for the Zorpe and attack independently of each other. Wave 3 would form an airborne reserve of five Lancasters, departing 90 minutes after the main force. This wave would only proceed to a target if it had not been destroyed or called to do so by five group. After the briefing, the men retired. Some played cricket, whilst others basked in the early summer sun. Some had a sense of foreboding, convinced they were going to be killed on the mission. Sergeant Garshevich, the wireless operator with Flight Lieutenant Astol's crew, chalked a parody of Churchill's famous quote on his aircraft's bomb. Never has so much been expected of so few. It would prove to be a solemn statement. In less than five hours, he and the rest of his crew would be killed in action. Gibson also had another reason to reflect. The previous afternoon, his black Labrador dog, Nigger, had been run over and killed outside Scampton's main gate. The dog had been with Gibson for many years and often flew with him on operations. He was popular with the other crews, who would often buy him a pint in the officer's mess. Gibson requested that Nigger be buried at midnight outside his office, the time he would be in action over the Myrna. At eight o'clock, the crews boarded the buses that would take them to their aircraft. As nine o'clock approached, Gibson's wireless operator, Flight Lieutenant Bob Hutchinson, fired a red flare as the signal for all first and second wave aircraft to start their engines. They taxied slowly from their departure points and lined up on the grass runway in their respective orders. The runway control van flashed green and the first aircraft began to roll. The Lancasters continued to taxi and take off until all 14 aircraft had departed. The remaining five would follow later if they were needed.
As the Lancasters headed for the North Sea, they settled at 100 feet, testing their spot labs, although most gunners refrained from testing their guns, preferring to save their precious ammunition. Soon the call resounded around each aircraft, enemy coast ahead. Crossing the coast, Gibson adjusted course after realizing with horror that they were over the heavily defended Valsheran Island, as stronger winds had carried them south over this heavily defended area. Fortunately, the enemy gunners did not appear to see them. The low height was providing some protection, but the moonlight was silhouetting them against the night sky. Accurate navigation was proving extremely difficult and all waves experienced problems in keeping to their designated flight paths. Unexpected flak also proved troublesome. Gibson was forced to break radio silence north of the Ruhr when a battery of guns and searchlights engaged them. Gibson's section of three aircraft reached the Myrna relatively unscathed as did Section 2, led by squadron leader Dingy Young. The last section of Wave 1 was not so lucky, as Flight Lieutenant Bill Astle collided with high-tension cables north of Dorsten, and his aircraft became engulfed in flames, crashing with the loss of all crew. At this time, Gibson was orbiting the Myrna with the other two aircraft in his section, flown by Flight Lieutenants Hopgood and Martin, respectively. Gibson decided to make a reconnaissance of the dam. The flak defences opened up. Six 20mm flak guns defended the dam. Some situated near the village of Gun, just below the dam others on the crest of the dam and on each tower. Attacking aircraft would have to fly between the towers. After completing his reconnaissance, Gibson radioed to the other aircraft that he was going in for the attack. Starting his run at the Corbecker Bridge, Gibson headed straight for the dam, with a rotating mine causing considerable vibration throughout the aircraft. As the spot lamps were switched on, the navigator, pilot officer Terum, guided Gibson lower and lower until they were skimming the reservoir at 60 feet. The German gunners fired at the illuminated aircraft racing towards them at nearly 240 miles per hour. In response, Flight Sergeant Deering in the front turret sprayed the enemy defences with tracer fire. As the dam rapidly approached, pilot officer Spafford, lying in the bomb aimer's position, watched the two towers grow larger in his bomb sight. Bomb gone. Upkeep dropped away, bounced and exploded, creating a huge column of water several hundred feet high. Hutchinson had fired a red flare to signal a successful release, illuminating the dense spray blood red. The dam held. The signal, Ghana, was transmitted back to England. Successful attack, but no breach. Hopgood was next. Gibson had called him on the VHF radio, advising him to commence his attack when ready. The gunners were waiting, and Hopgood's aircraft was hit on the approach, resulting in his bomb being released late. It bounced over the crest of the dam, destroying the power station below. Only two made it before the tanks exploded. Hopgood and the remaining crew members were killed. Martin was next. To aid his attack, Gibson decided to fly ahead in an attempt to draw the enemy fire away. Despite this, Martin's aircraft was hit, but he managed to drop his bomb correctly. He radioed Gibson when he was clear of the flag. By this time, Section 2 of the first wave had arrived, flown by Squadron Leader Young and Flight Lieutenant Shannon and Maltby. Young attacked first and did more damage. Gibson again engaged the flak whilst Martin flew alongside to split the defences. He dropped his bomb successfully, making a small breach. Again, the code word, Connor, was sent. 
Maltby then attacked. Gibson and Martin once again engaged the gunners. His bomb bounced and hit. As the spray subsided, the dam began to crack as tons of masonry gave way. The crews were transfixed at this amazing sight. Millions of tons of water were beginning to pour down the valley. Back at Grantham, Wing Commander Wally Dunn, Five Group Signals Officer, had been listening through his earphones, reporting the incoming Morse code signals to the assembled officers. Across the room, Wallace was staring into space. At this moment, transmission started, and his ears instantly recognized first the letter N, then I, then G. Then he heard Dunn shout, Nigger! They had done it. Harris congratulated Wallace, who was ecstatic. Squadron leader Maudsley, Flight Lieutenant Shannon, and Pilot Officer Knight headed for the Ada Dam with Gibson and Young, whilst the remaining aircraft headed for home. The Ada was undefended, but rested among steep hills at the end of a winding valley. These hills would prove to be the greatest problem. Only a fraction of the space was available for the crews to get the airspeed and height correct compared to the Myrna. The approach run would take them in a dive past Waldeck Castle, and then turning steeply to port, hopping over a narrow spit and heading for the dam. Mist was beginning to form in the valley, and Dave Shannon found himself lost. Gibson radioed him and fired a flare to guide him to the correct area. Pilots found the steep approach difficult. After several attempts by Maudsley and Shannon, the latter released his bomb, which bounced and hit the wall, but did not breach the dam. Maudsley then made another attempt. His aircraft may have been damaged on the flight in, and his weapon was released late, exploding on the parapet. His aircraft survived and headed for home, but was shot down near Emesh, approaching the Rhine. All the crew were killed. Knight had the last bomb. He made a successful run. His weapon bounced and hit the dam perfectly. the dam began to collapse to the jubilation of the crews. The code word, dinghy, was transmitted. The aircraft headed back to England. The aircraft of Wave 2 had taken off singly to attack the Zorpe. They flew on the northern route to cross the Dutch coast 120 miles north of Wave 1. Due to their flight path being longer, they took off first. This was intended to split the defences and possibly convince the Germans that these were nothing more than nuisance attacks. On the route to the Zorpe, two Lancasters flown by Jeff Rice and Les Munro were forced to turn back to Scampton, while two more were shot down. Rice had lost his bomb when coming into contact with the sea, and Munro had been hit by flak. Flight Lieutenant McCarthy reached the Zorpe, followed later by Flight Sergeant Brown from the reserve wave, both using a different method of attack as brief. Because the Zorpe was a shallow, sloping earth wall, any upkeep attack could cause the bomb to roll straight over the crest, as this test film shot of Recolver illustrates. The lack of sluice towers would also rule out any range release reference for the bomb aimer. The preferred method was for the aircraft to fly along the dam as opposed to at it, dropping the bomb dead center from a height of some 30 feet and with no rotation. Joe McCarthy made 10 runs of the dam, dropping his bomb dead center and damaging the crest. Brown arrived to discover the dam shrouded in mist with only the spire of Langshide Church for reference. Disorientated, he flew up the wrong side. Realizing his error, he had to perform a stalled turn due to his falling airspeed. 
after six attempts, he released, causing more damage to the crest, but no breach of the dam. The waning night was heralding dawn, so both headed back to England. As the returning aircraft arrived back at Scampton, the full cost of the mission became apparent. Eight of the 19 Lancasters had been lost. 53 aircrew had been killed. Upon hearing the news, Wallace was inconsolable. He felt personally responsible for the deaths and remained deeply affected by them for the rest of his career. It was, of course, not his fault. The residents of the Myrna and Ada Valleys awoke to a changed landscape. The breach in the Myrna Dam measured 76 meters wide by 22 meters deep. By noon the following day, 87% of the reservoir had disappeared through it in a tidal wave 10 meters high. In towns located in the path of the deluge, damage was extensive. In Neheim alone, eight miles away, over 850 people were killed. In places, foundations were all that remained of houses. Over a dozen factories have been destroyed with a further hundred damaged. 2,800 hectares of land was submerged beyond use and numerous railway bridges have been swept away. In total, nearly 1,500 people had been killed. Many had sought shelter underground when the air raid sirens had first sounded. The Ada Valley saw similar scenes. Over 30,000 tons of masonry have been dislodged, with the floodwaters affecting areas up to 250 miles away. There were other indirect results of the raid. The German armaments minister, Albert Speer, visited the area and ordered that both dams be repaired as soon as possible, before the autumn rains arrived. To achieve this, he ordered 27,000 men diverted from other vital construction work, many of whom had been working on Hitler's Atlantic Wall project. By October, the dams had been repaired, and 10,000 frontline troops were assigned to defend them from further bomber command attacks. The Zorpe escaped destruction, experiencing only superficial damage to its crest and the power station located below. Upkeep proved to be an unsuitable weapon for Earth-type dams. The surviving crews were highly decorated, including five distinguished service orders, 12 distinguished flying medals, 14 distinguished flying crosses and two conspicuous gallantry medals. Gibson received the Victoria Cross. The presentations were held at Buckingham Palace. After the raid, Gibson left 617 Squadron to perform public relations duties. He subsequently returned to flying and on the 19th of September 1944, he was master bomber directing an attack on Wright and Mönchengladbach. On the return flight, their mosquito crashed in Holland. Gibson and his navigator, squadron leader Jim Warwick, were killed instantly. Gibson was 26. After the success of the raid, Wallace attained an enormous amount of credibility. He later developed his original 10-ton bomb design into two weapons. 617 Squadron used both of these weapons in late 1944 and early 1945. Tallboy succeeded in capsizing the fearsome battleship, the Tirpitz, in a Norwegian fjord, and Grand Slam felled the mighty Bielefeld viaduct. After the war, Wallace developed variable geometry aeronautics, insisting that all of the testing be carried out by unmanned drones. Following the raid on the dams, he had vowed never to risk another man's life. Sixty years later, his work lives on in the swing-wing aircraft of today. 617 Squadron still occupy the skies today. Proud of their heritage, they continue to undertake awe-inspiring feats of flying in both times of war and of peace. Their heroic bravery continues to ensure them an exalted place in history, forever known simply as the Dambusters.